Canada's high Arctic. From the northernmost extremity of the world's fifth largest island to the highest point in mainland North America. Protecting the waters of Lancaster Sound for future generations. For the Arctic, it's a hugely important, um, ecologically important area. An annual adventure stalking Canada's far north for winter. A sea lift is bringing cargo on land for all the people that live here, and it's necessary because they need, they need the cargo to, to live. And artists of the Arctic bringing this vast landscape to life. To this day, I just carve little pieces to survive. Now, we reveal the secrets of Canada's northern boundary, more than 160,000 kilometers of Arctic frontier. Canada, over the edge. On the northwest tip of Baffin Island, in Canada's high Arctic, the hamlet of Arctic Bay lies on the shores of Adams Sound. Arctic Bay is located just north of the 73rd parallel, the third northernmost community in Canada. It dates back to 1936, with the establishment of a Hudson's Bay trading post and the arrival of Inuit from Panyertung and Cape Dorset, who were relocated here. Today, Arctic Bay is home to some 750 hardy residents. Ninety-five percent of the population is of Inuit descent. While the community of Arctic Bay was established in the 20th century, locals say the region has been inhabited for 5,000 years. They call Arctic Bay Ikpiarjuk, translated the pocket, from the Inuktitut language. It is a reference to the community's sheltered location on a south-facing gravel beach surrounded by incredible hills. From May 6th to August 6th, Arctic Bay enjoys 24-hour sunlight. But by September, summer will be forgotten with winter and 24-hour darkness on its way. In the high Arctic summer, Arctic Bay is a stopping place for cruise ships and pleasure craft sailing the Northwest Passage. But vessels like this have a narrow window. Sea ice in Admiralty Inlet doesn't melt until the end of July, making water travel impossible for most of the year. It is a reality of life in Arctic Bay, a fact that makes Nunavut Sea Link and Supplies annual visit crucial for the survival of the community. Roma Laframboise coordinates operations on the ground, moving winter supplies from an offshore cargo ship to smaller barges and finally to shore. A sea lift is bringing cargo on land for all the people that live here, and it's necessary because they need, they need the cargo to, to live by. Like for the co-op, we bring food and uh, everything that's necessary for, the, for life around here.
There is a transportation by plane, but it, it costs much more than by boat, and we have uh, the quantities we can uh, we can load on a boat is, uh, I mean, it's 10, 20 times more than a plane, so uh, it costs much less, that's why. Laframboise and team spend weeks each year resupplying communities throughout the Eastern Arctic. We start by loading the boat in Montreal, in Sainte Catherine, and then uh, we come here and I do the log logistics, make sure that every crate's off and every, every crate's in, in good order. And then uh, they, take, they take the crane, they empty the, the lower holes, the, the, the twin decks, the, the, the bridge, and then uh, they put it on the barge. The two biggest uh, items we had here, they were, uh, they, they were tanks for the uh, for colic energy. I mean, the, the guys that, for power, Nunavut power, they were tanks that were about, uh, I'd say, 50 feet long. Uh, so they carried it with two loaders all the way up there. And then we have smaller crates all the way down to maybe a uh, foot by a foot. That, that's, that, that's, we got vehicles, we got, uh, sometimes we got heavy vehicles like excavators, carry anything. Sometimes we carry a uh, mobile, mobile home, uh, it's, uh, but mostly it's containers. Offshore, Charles Cote of Riviere de Loup, Quebec, moves supplies from ship to shore. Mon nom Charles Cote, euh, je suis un marin du Anna des Gagnés. Euh, sur le bateau, on a environ euh, 20 000 mètres cubes à bord de, de General Cargo, soit de conteneurs, véhicules. Oui, on est équipé de quatre cranes plus un jumbo lift. Les quatre cranes, euh, c'est des 45 tonnes. Et le jumbo lift, c'est pour lever les, les bulldozers, loaders, tout ce qui est de 125 tonnes et moins. Il y a une capacité de 125 tonnes maximum. C'est euh, beaucoup d'organisation. On a un bon planning. On a un toolbox meeting à chaque matin qui nous disent, ils nous expliquent quoi faire. Bon, mais maintenant, je vais retourner à l'ouvrage. Merci. The resupply mission, or sea lift as it is known, is one of the most highly anticipated days of the year in Arctic Bay. Residents eagerly await oil tanks, sofas, televisions, even trucks, purchased and shipped from the south. And it's not just special for residents of Arctic Bay. For La Framboise, the sea lift has become tradition. For Cote, it is in his blood. Well, it's my fourth year uh, doing, doing the, the, the sea lift up north. Uh, my first year, I was really surprised by, uh, I mean, by the scenery and uh, by, it's, it's really the wilderness, really. It's, uh, it's, Somebody who's never been here and he just works down south, when he comes here, it's another world completely. It's almost like another planet. It's special because I'm the fourth generation to work on the boat of my family. My grandfather has come here in the 60s. And I'm going to continue the tradition. Arctic Bay sits just meters from the protected waters of Adams Sound. Its harbor is a safe haven, nestled between a series of geological wonders. Holy Cross Point to the east and Uluxon Point to the west. Heading west, the Aluxon Peninsula rises high. Here, the St. George's Society cliffs dominate the horizon.
The cliffs are a mix of dolomite and shale, rising 250 meters from the sea. They are a popular hike for visitors to Arctic Bay, keen to experience the beauty of the region. But these cliffs and the water surrounding are more than just a scenic destination. They have been a valuable source of natural resources for centuries. Generations ago, slate found here was harvested and used to produce Inuit tools. And the waters of Adams Sound were valuable fishing grounds for the Inuit and explorers like Captain William Adams, the first European to reach Arctic Bay in 1872. In total, the St. George's Society Cliffs and the Aluxon Peninsula stretch nearly 10 kilometers to Aluxon Point and the open waters of Admiralty Inlet beyond. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. Moving north, beyond the Aluxon Peninsula, we reach Graveyard Point. Graveyard Point is located opposite Cape Strathcona and marks the southern boundary between Admiralty Inlet and incredible Strathcona Sound. Here, just kilometers from Admiralty Inlet, steep cliff faces and hoodoo structures rise high. These vivid colors are a mix of dark red mudstones and shales, along with gray sandstones and slit stones. It is a rich geological wonder, extending for kilometers, and part of a geological region known as the Strathcona Sound Formation. Strathcona Sound is named after Donald Smith, also known as Lord Strathcona. He was a Scottish Canadian, famous in the late 19th and early 20th century as a member of the First Council of the Northwest Territories and president of the Canadian Pacific Railway. A century after his death, these awe-inspiring marvels continue his legacy.
Next, we head west across the open waters of Admiralty Inlet. Admiralty Inlet was first charted by Sir Edmund Perry in 1820. It stretches some 250 kilometers south from Lancaster Sound, separating the Borden Peninsula on the east from the Brodeur Peninsula to the west. Admiralty Inlet has been called the world's largest fjord. On land, the Brodeur Peninsula is a massive headland, a parcel of land extending far out to sea. The Brodeur Peninsula was given its name by explorer Joseph Bernier during a 1907 expedition, naming it in honor of Louis-Philippe Brodeur, Minister of Marine and Fisheries at the time. It is surrounded by Admiralty Inlet to the east, Prince Regent Inlet to the west, and Lancaster Sound to the north. It is a remote scenic wonder. Finally, on approach to Cape Crawford, chunks of sea ice stretch as far as the eye can see. And further, just below the 74th parallel, we approach Sergeant Point. With remote Devon Island on the horizon, Sergeant Point marks an important milestone. It is the northernmost point of land on Baffin Island, the fifth largest island in the world. Heading south from the northernmost point on Baffin Island, we trace the eastern perimeter of the Brodeur Peninsula. It is a stunning Arctic landmass, featuring plateaus, cliffs, and further inland, rivers, streams, and valleys. Here on the coast, the Turner Cliffs stretch for kilometers.
They are part of a geological region known as the Admiralty Group, a mix of dolomite and quartz sandstones rising more than 400 meters. The Turner Cliffs are from the Cambrian and Ordovician era. Rock roughly 500 million years old. At that time, the Brodeur Peninsula and the land surrounding were located near the equator, covered by shallow seas. Today, fossils containing tiny invertebrate can be found in these hills. Continuing south, we approach St. Patrick's Canyon and just offshore, one of the Arctic's world famous attractions. Each year, some 40,000 icebergs calve from Greenland's glaciers. While many make their way south to Newfoundland and Labrador, some drift into Lancaster Sound and into Admiralty Inlet. They are a common but spectacular sight here. Icebergs can be hundreds of meters long weighing more than 10 million tons and measure 30% wider below surface than above. They are more than 10,000 years old, incredible cathedrals of the Arctic seas. Further south, beyond Kakiak Point, the geological wonders of the region rise to new heights. Here, 
A breathtaking set of rock structures rises from the sea. It is a spectacle known locally as the gallery. The gallery formation marks the southern portion of the Admiralty Group, with rocks slightly older than the Turner Cliffs to the north. These ethereal wonders are made of quartz-rich sandstone, carved by ancient winding rivers over millions of years. Offshore, the waters of Admiralty Inlet line the horizon. They are key waters for navigation, for tourism, and fishing. And today, they are part of a proposed protected area. The Lancaster Sound National Marine Protected Area is an idea that has been in the works for decades one that someday could protect much of the eastern Arctic's waters. Lancaster Sound is at the entrance to the Northwest Passage in the eastern Arctic. And uh, st studies over the last 50 years have shown it's extremely important ecologically and culturally. Back in the 1970s, the initial idea to protect this area was a result of oil and gas exploration. And uh, through the years, there's been different, uh, different attempts to work on that. And, and in 2009, the QIA, which is a Kikitani Inuit Association, the federal government and Governor Nunavut signed an agreement uh, to uh, study the feasibility of creating a marine conservation area. A protected area in Lancaster Sound would be different from conventional national parks by recognizing the unique natural and cultural connections to the area. By comparison with national parks, uh, where their primary goal is uh, management for conservation, public education, and enjoyment, uh, national marine conservation areas have an additional goal of management for ecological uh, sustainability. What that means is that traditional activities such as fishing, uh, uh, resource harvesting by Inuit can continue. We have five communities uh, associated with this uh, proposed boundary and that includes uh, Clyde River, Pond Inlet, Arctic Bay, Resolute Bay and Grease Fjord. And essentially, the, uh, the waterways surrounding uh, Bylet Island and Lancaster Sound are kind of the social and economic um, uh, lifeblood, as you would say, for the, for the community residents. Uh, they're the transportation corridors. Uh, the, the, it provides food and resources for them. Uh, the local people, you know, depend on the resources that are here. Kerry Elvram says while traditional harvest would continue, the protected status would be a benefit, restricting natural resource exploration in the area, an area he believes is unique in the world. 
Well, there's a lot of marine mammals and uh, seabirds that uh, uh, reside here. Um, we have the iconic polar bear. Uh, we have several whale species, uh, including bowhead, uh, beluga, and narwhal. Uh, the odd killer whale comes up here. We have uh, several seal species, um, walrus, uh, and a number of birds from uh, kittiwakes, fulmers, um, you know, and a variety of other sea ducks. I've been to many, many different places uh, across Canada, and uh, I've discovered that each place has a uniqueness about it that makes it special. And uh, it, you have a, an, a, has an ability to grab you and feel connected to, to your environment in a different way. And uh, this place has been tremendous in that respect for me. You get a surreal moments and uh, almost transcend space and time and you can imagine what people used to, what it used to be like for people to live here. Fifty kilometers west of the Brodeur Peninsula, Somerset Island measures more than 24,000 square kilometers. The island is the ninth largest in the Arctic archipelago and ranks among the largest uninhabited islands in the world. Somerset Island is 260 kilometers long and ranges from 35 to 170 kilometers wide. It features two main geological landscapes. To the southwest, an elevated area lining the waters of Peel Sound reveals exposed Precambrian granite. And here in the northeast, vast expanses of sedimentary rock stretch for kilometers. There is almost no vegetation or shelter. But despite the elements, Somerset Island is home to animal life. Here, muskox have been making a comeback in recent decades. They are incredible mammals with thick fur coats capable of enduring bitter winters and an awe-inspiring sight on this barren Arctic landscape. Continuing south, Somerset Island narrows. It is bordered by Barrow Strait to the north, Prince Regent Inlet to the east, and Peel Sound to the west. To the south, Somerset Island is lined by one of the North's most unique waterways, Bellet Strait. Locals say Bellet Strait is one of the few year-round ice-free waterways in the region.
And it was here, on Bellet Strait's North Shore, that the Hudson's Bay Company established their final trading post in 1937. Fort Ross was supposed to link the east and west fur trading regions of the Arctic. The fort had two buildings, a store and a manager's residence. But barely a decade after it was built, Fort Ross was relocated south, with heavy ice to the east and west making commerce impossible. Just two kilometers away, we reach Bellet Strait's barren southern shore. Here, at the northern extremity of Murchison Promontory, Zenith Point represents a unique geographic landmark. Located 64 kilometers above Barrow, Alaska, this remote corner of Canada is the northernmost point in mainland North America. Continuing south, beyond the Murchison Promontory, we soar above the vast expanses of the Boothia Peninsula. The Boothia Peninsula measures more than 30,000 square kilometers, a vast tundra plateau. The first European explorer to reach the peninsula was Sir James Ross. He named it Boothia Felix in honor of the patron of his expedition, Sir Felix Booth. And it was here, in 1831, that Ross determined the first location of the North Magnetic Pole. With changes to the Earth's magnetic core, the pole has since moved further north to Ellesmere Island and beyond. On the ground, the Boothia Peninsula is covered in stone, limestone sediments, and granite bedrock, a landscape that becomes more rugged each kilometer south. Finally, this rocky trajectory leads to civilization and the community of Talaweak. Talaweak lies at the southwestern coast of the Boothia Peninsula. It is home to 850 people, with 98% of the population of Inuit descent. The community, once known as Spence Bay, 
was moved here in 1948 when the Hudson's Bay Company closed Fort Ross and relocated south. Talawayok is translated large caribou hunting blind from Inuktitut, a reference to large piles of stones built along traditional caribou migration routes to aid in hunting. Today, the Talawayok region remains popular for hiking, hunting, and fishing. One hundred twenty-five kilometers to the southwest, Joe Haven is another eastern Arctic gem, located on the western shores of King William Island. It is home to more than a thousand people and boasts a unique landscape, a community built on Arctic sand. Residents of Talawiak and Joe Haven are descendants of the ancient Thule peoples and have inhabited this region for more than a thousand years. Many still spend months each year on the land, continuing and developing local traditions. My name is Charlie Oakpeak, and I'm from Joe Haven, Nunavut, and I'm a carver. I started carving about 20 years ago, probably 20, 25 years ago, and then to this day, I just carve little pieces to survive. Stone carving is a way of life for many in Joe Haven. And while Upik completes his carvings here, the process begins many kilometers away. When it's fall time, winter time, when the ice is thick enough, we go about south from here, about 80 kilometers, and 50, 50 kilometers ocean, and about 30 kilometers inland. We go pick up the soapstone during the winter and then bring it back by Kamutix. Upik's workstation is located at the foot of his driveway, with dust making indoor carving impossible. His table is adorned with tools, stones, even whale bones, donated to him by local residents keen to help out. Okay, this is where I carve. This is my lamp, homemade lamp, for staying bright. It's out of my, my light out there is out of order. And uh, this is my five inch grinder with a four and a half inch diamond blade. After I cut everything up with this, I start smoothing up with a diamond blade with the carbide bits. The process begins with a simple axe, getting rid of unwanted cracks and chunks of rock that won't make the final cut. Upik's specialty is carving exotic faces, a trademark of Joe Haven carvers. Right now I'm just cutting up a piece of rock, uh, probably gonna be a face. Not worth anything right now, but Probably in the end, probably trade, trade the rock with them, some, some money. So I got no time for that, so I better get the show on a roll here.
I do some small faces, bigger faces, uh, out of soapstone. A little bit different from animals, and so many people could make animals, and so some people like seeing different little stuff sometimes. But you know, sometimes they're pretty silly. They're pretty funny carvings, and they're freaky, and stuff like that. Charlie Upik could practice his craft in many locations. But for him, his decision to return home decades ago was an easy one. It's my hometown, I guess, and I grew up here. So I was in and out of Joe Haven for, since I was 20 or something. Uh, came back and stayed back here then, so from 94. To this day, I'm here, and I do a little bit of carving on my table, and, survive, I guess. From the soaring geological wonders of Strathcona Sound and Admiralty Inlet. To stunning sea ice tracing the northernmost reaches of Baffin Island. to the rocky contours of Somerset Island and the Boothia Peninsula. Canada's high Arctic is a stunning mix of landscapes on land and on water. It's friendly, timeless communities extreme geographic boundaries, an awe-inspiring abundant ocean life make the high Arctic a nearly untouched wonder. Thousands of years after humans first arrived on these shores, the seasons and cycles of nature continue to determine life here. A world-class wonder waiting to be discovered here on the edge of Canada.